This conference will now be recorded. Bueno.
Time for everybody to have more caffeine. Come on. I said time for everybody to have more caffeine. No, nah, I'm good. Hey, are we recording this? I just started to because I think I think Emily had asked me to earlier and I forgot. They had requested it. Because I noticed in the top it said record and I just now realized that. Yeah, so I I think I pressed it. I believe it is recording now, yeah. And um but I'm not sure how anybody would access the recording. I guess it would have to be uploaded in uh, either on Canvas or through an email. Yeah, so okay. it'll automatically process the, the audio awesome. data and everything and your and your screen as well. And then uh, you can send it out as an MP4 file and then you guys can watch it on QuickTime and hear everything and see everything. Because I literally just did that. I had a lunch and learn processed the audio and the video and then sent it out through email so we could do the same or put it on canvas you can recap it over you guys can go over, over. We okay so yeah i'll have to just uh i'll talk with you emily on how to do that because i've never yeah, done that before it should um i, I was just looking at the settings Go to your settings, the little gear. Oh yeah, I see the gear. And then click more down on the bottom, or no, what is it? The little uh, slide tool, open preferences on the bottom right. Okay. And then, um, let's see. As when meeting ends. So go to, yeah, go to recordings on the, on the menu oh, on the left. Yep. And it'll say uh, local recordings. Recordings must be converted before anyone can view them. And then right. select remind me to convert recordings. Oh, remind me. Okay. And it's then clicked. below yeah. it shows you where they're going to be saved. So mine is automatically going into my documents. If I were recording. So you can put it on your desktop for easy access or whatever you want to do. Right. And then also where you can go back and see them. Um, like it says view and share your recordings online. I, th I haven't tried that yet, but I think it's an option. So this is where we'll, uh, okay. we'll do it, I guess. So and at the end of this, it'll remind me to convert and then I'll hit the revert recordings now. I think so. It, well, it'll probably, as you when you end the meeting, it'll pop up and say, do you want to convert? And then you just click yes, and then it'll automatically do it for you. See? somewhere on your, um, on your computer in your documents. Okay. All right. And they'll stay specific to this cohort in this class. It won't be like used. We'll categorize it by the date of the meeting, I think, okay. probably, or the whatever, you know, it'll, it'll have the, yes, it'll just be specific to this class in this okay. meeting. All right. Okay. All right. I will look to do that then. <gasps> There's all kinds of like bells and whistles on this that I don't know about. Neat. Yeah, it's cool actually. I like it. <laughs> I like it too. Um, I don't know if I like it enough to purchase it personally, but <laughs> I have. Uh, I think that I actually can probably use Zoom through my FIU account, but now that we have this working for the next you know week or so, I'm not going to worry about it right now. All right, where did it go? Here we go. All right, is everybody available? I see. So maybe right. maybe Howard. Present. Yeah, guys. So I think it's James Trevor. Who's who's EC? Oh, that's Emily. Emily came back in. <clears throat> Hi, Emily. <clears throat> Good Emily. Yeah. Oh, hold on one second. Just be glad I'm here to be holding. All right. So I think I figured out a way <clears throat> over lunch how to uh, make it so that I can set my computer on a chair and then I've got to walk away so I'll be able to do some demonstration so you'll be able to see um, some of the stuff I'm talking about. Um, when it comes to pelvis and trunk, some of these deviations um, can get really confusing. 
in the way that they're um, sort of characterized and named. And so it, I know when I teach this live that I do a whole lot of demonstration of it. And so that's kind of where we're gonna shoot to go um, this afternoon as well. Um, we probably have <clears throat> between what I have left for lecture and having you all practice using the form for 15 minutes on a video, we probably have about an hour's worth left of this material. <clears throat> and then um, I planned on talking to you about, uh, like I said, the common sort of pathologies that you're going to see clinically. Um, we can get through that second PowerPoint somewhat quickly. Some of that material, I'm trying to think of how much of it is on the exam. Um, there might be a couple of questions from that material on the exam. You already have the PDF, um, but there's there are certain um, diagnoses that I might skip over. I don't particularly think, and and maybe some of you have um, some input. Alex, you're the one who's who's worked as a prosthetic tech, right? Uh, yeah, Victor has as well. Oh, and Victor as well. Okay. Um, so I don't know if you all see Parkinson's patients really pass through your clinics all that much. Yes, no? Um, yeah, sometimes. All right. So I was going to maybe skip certain diagnoses, but we can get through that material quick, you know, somewhat quickly. But, you know, my goal is to try to finish up around 3, 3.30 today, and we should be able to get through everything. Um, but we'll see how this next bunch of material goes, because this is probably... Uh, we saved it for after lunch, but this is probably the, the hardest part um, of, of the gate. This is where people struggle a little bit more with some of the gate identification stuff when it comes to pelvis and trunk. All right, but let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> All right. Why do I have this slide here? See, sometimes I need to know what my notes are for. So just as a review, this is normally what we would want to see in the pelvis during walking. So remember when I showed you the skeleton yesterday that the PSIS, which are over up toward the upper left, and the ASIS are naturally on that 10 degree incline, um, just anatomically. So normally during walking, what we would want to, what we would see is maybe a little bit of the anterior tilt in the sagittal plane um, of the pelvis. And more than that would be considered a deviation. Uh, certainly in the frontal plane, uh, if we see more than a four to five degree drop, and that's going to be the one of the ones that we talk about more. So when we get to um, some of the deviations, that's going to be considered a deviation. And then normally we're going to want to see that five degrees of forward transverse pelvic rotation and five degrees of backward transverse pelvic rotation. All right, so looking at our sheet, the first one is hip hiking. I'm sorry, pelvic hiking. I always call it hip hiking. Technically, it's pelvic hike. So this is elevation of one side of the pelvis above the neutral horizontal plane. This is happening during the swing phases of gait. This is not uh, Trendelenburg gait? This is not. So we're looking at the left leg currently. And we're looking at hip hiking in the swing phase. And that's the only time this happens. We're, so at this point, I just want you to focus on that right now. Does everybody see how his pelvis is raising up as he comes through and swing? It's a pretty obvious mm -hmm. one. It's a pretty common one. So, so again, yes, go ahead. I have a question here. So with the difference between this and the Dellenberg gate, it's the fact of the normal on the affected side is going up instead of the normal on the contralateral side is down, correct? In Trendelenburg, the contralateral side goes down. So when we get to, we've got a couple of deviations to go before we get to what is termed Trendelenburg. So okay. I really want to kind of save that conversation for when we get there. Okay. Because there's going to be, I just want you to focus right now on, and I know that just said circumduction on the video, ignore that. All I want you to focus on right now is just the pelvic height. And we are going to get to, you know, 
the other pelvic drops, the Trendelenburgs and things like that in a few slides. But the, the thing here is the effective side is going up. Correct. Higher. Yes. Right. During swing. So if you look at the sheet, this can only happen during the swing phase. This does not occur during stance. So the left side is our reference limb and the hip or the pelvis is being raised during swing. It is a major deviation during initial swing, mid swing, not so much during terminal swing or pre-swing. It is a major deviation during initial swing and mid swing. It's going to affect forward progression. And the reason it's affecting forward progression is this person is hiking their pelvis instead of rotating it forward in the transverse plane. That forward rotation in the transverse plane is what we use to, to um, extend our step length. Somebody who is doing pelvic hike is likely lacking rotation, and so they're not going to have as long of a step length on that limb. So instead of rotating in the transverse plane, this person is just hiking their pelvis upward and swinging the limb forward. But we're looking right at the pelvis. Don't worry about what the thigh is doing or anything else at this point. So causes for this pretty commonly are limited knee flexion or hip flexion. This person looks like they are lacking both hip flexion and knee flexion during the swing phase. So can you see how their leg is pretty straight? So if they don't hike their pelvis, it's probably gonna drag. So this hiking of the pelvis is a comp compensatory motion so they don't drag their foot because they can't bend their knee enough and they're not flexing their hip enough. We also see this due to excess plantar flexion at the ankle, which this person also has. So this person has all of these things. Limited knee flexion at initial swing, they should have 60 degrees, they certainly don't. Um, or limited hip flexion at mid swing, you know, they should be pushing um, a good 15 degrees of hip flexion or more at mid swing. Excess plantar flexion at mid swing, yes, they definitely have that. And it's intentional to clear the swing limb. So that's why we see this hip height. I'm sorry, pelvic height. I keep calling it pelvic hip height, but it's pelvic height. And again, this one's on YouTube if you want to look back at it. All right, so we're going to move on. Posterior pelvic tilt. So this is tilting the pelvis so that the pubic symphysis is pointed upward. This is people with your really um, kyphotic posture. So people who are kind of hunched over, we see this a lot in our elderly. Their lumbar lordosis is decreased. They have a great big kyphotic um, spinal uh, deformity in the thoracic spine. Um, so I, some people don't have a lot of kyphotic, but certainly you almost always see a forward head with this posture, and you'll see that posterior pelvic tilt. Um, this can happen in any phase of gait, but additionally, it is not going to be a major deviation if you look at our slide or at our um, at our form. It is a minor deviation. That means it's not good for their posture. It's not optimal for their breathing pattern or things like that, but it is something that's pretty common. And in fact, you probably know people that are not that old that have this type of posture. Anterior pelvic tilt is the tilting of the pelvis so the pubic symphysis is pointed down beyond normal. Um, so the reference is the line between the ASIS and the PSIS. So again, that 10 degree reference line. Um, this again can occur in any phase of gait. It usually maintains itself throughout the gait pattern. This is somebody who's got a really um, increased lumbar lordosis a lot of times. Um, this can be due to hip flexion contractures or spasticity. Um, weak hip extensors, abdominal muscle weakness. This is a posture that you are almost always going to see on your bilateral transfemoral amputees. So people with bilateral transfemoral amputation, almost 100% of the time, have an increased anterior pelvic tilt. 
Um, some of that is due to the hip extensors not being optimal anymore. So our hip extensors are the ones that sort of pull our pelvis back into um, back into sort of a posterior pelvic tilt. They're attached at our ischial tuberosities. That's where they initiate, um, and then they they um, they terminate down at the tibia. But now our tibias are gone because we're transfemoral amputee on both sides. So now these hip extensors, which used to pull our pelvis down and keep it in a nice posture, they've kind of gotten loosened and our pelvis is allowed to flex forward. Yes, question. Um, so also with this, um, with being bilateral transfem, a lot of knee units, you have to push back with your hip like that, like put your hip in a little bit of extension to lock the knee. So they have to kind of form that position anyway in order to maintain stability with those knee points. Yeah, certainly the prosthesis will contribute to this type of posture. Um, but that is probably the best example of a patient population that you will almost always see an yeah. increase in their anterior pelvic tilt. Doesn't really limit them, it's just not good for their back. Um, over time, it's gonna start to cause issues potentially with the disc. All right, limited pelvic rotation. So we're gonna pick the right side right now to look at. So we're this can happen in the forward and the backward, um, uh, it, forward and backward in the transverse plane. This woman has limited transverse pelvic rotation forward. So if we watch what her right a, P, ASIS area is doing, she's not getting that nice forward rotation of the pelvis as she puts her foot on the ground for the right leg. It sort of stays back or at least to neutral. So when she takes a step, she's not bringing her pelvis forward in that transverse plane. This is one of the hardest deviations to see, but can you kind of see how she's keeping her pelvis back on that side as she steps forward? It just looks like she's off balance. Like it doesn't look like her pelvis is the issue. It looks like her proprioception is the issue. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this woman, I think, probably has a major head injury. So right. It could so be how would you know the difference between like bad proprioception and then this like um, incorrect pelvic rotation? So what you're observing, and we're only going by what you observe, is she okay. lacks forward transverse pelvic rotation. One of the causes might be that she doesn't have proprioception to know where her body is in space, that she has ataxia, she's got impaired motor control. That's a cause of this deviation. Okay. So they're two separate things. You're noticing one thing, so remember back to our first slides today, you're noticing one thing, and then you're gonna break down what you think is causing it. But the actual observation is what this is. So we observe it, then we try to figure out the cause, and then we try to fix the cause if we can. So she's got a lot of motor control issues, but certainly she's not getting that nice forward rotation that we wanna see in the pelvis as she swings her leg forward. The pelvis is actually kind of hanging backward or not coming through to neutral. So her trunk and her pelvis is almost staying as one unit and her legs are just moving forward. And there's very little rotation in her trunk or her pelvis as she walks. Do you all kind of see that a little bit? Yeah, definitely. On her, she looks very stiff. And so again, on her, it's pretty obvious and it might not be as obvious on other folks, but the more that you watch gait, the more you're gonna be able to pick up this deviation. So again, impaired motor control um, of the trunk or the pelvis is gonna cause this. If somebody's had a surgical fusion of their spine, so they're not able to rotate the lower part of their lumbar spine, that might limit how much they can rotate their pelvis forward or backward while they're walking. Low back pain, I don't know if any of you all have had back pain, but I know I've had it occasionally severe enough where I walk pretty stiff. Like I limit how much I rotate my body and my steps are shorter because without that pelvic rotation, I'm gonna take shorter step lengths. 
So it could decrease step length unilaterally or bilaterally. This lady's, this lady doesn't have any decreased step length, it looks like, because she's got so much excessive hip flexion during some of her phases of swing. So she's got a lot of other stuff going on. But again, we're just focusing on what her pelvis isn't doing right now. Excessive forward pelvic rotation. This man, we're looking at the left side. If you watch his pelvis over here, and I know it's gonna be hard because we're, he's gonna turn direction, but he almost throws his pelvis forward as he takes a step. So he's taking an excessive rotation of the pelvis. If you watch him from behind, if you watch here, he's taking his pelvis on the left and he's swinging it forward, swinging it forward swinging it forward. So he's almost forcing that side of his pelvis forward more as he's taking a step. And that's to help increase his step length. So this is a greater than normal uh, forward pelvic rotation in the transverse plane. Um, this is going to be not a major deviation at any point. Um, it is a minor deviation. Eventually, if he kept using his, his back this way and overusing the pelvis on that side, he could start to get back pain. Um, but this is intentional to advance the limb during terminal swing. They're trying to extend that step length. So he's trying to reach his leg out, trying to reach it out, trying to reach it out. And to do that, he's just throwing his pelvis forward on that left side. So he's got too much rotation forward yes question so could you mark this up as excessive forward pelvic rotation if he's not going past the normal uh angle of rotation or degrees of rotation but doing it quicker you know uh, it's a good I think thing I, controlled speed mm -hmm. right per this form you are only going to mark it if you see it so if he has 10 degrees it's not going to be excessive what I would do if you notice something like that, though, is certainly make a note in your own notes that you think that it's, you know, maybe a lack of control or he's um, rowing it forward quickly than we would normally see. One of the reasons he's doing this is because he can't, he doesn't have push off on his paretic side. He's not able to get some of that recoil in the gastroc to help propel the leg forward, like in normal gait. So what he has to do is use his pelvis to throw the leg forward. But again, if it's not past the normal five degrees of rotation that you would see in the forward plane or in the transverse plane, then you don't mark it. You can mark that he's doing it faster. But my guess is if he's doing it faster, he's probably got excessive rotation yeah. because okay. he's making an effort to really swing that leg forward. So that might be, this is a difficult deviation to see. So if you see that somebody's really trying to swing their leg forward using their pelvis, I think it's a pretty good indication that they've got excessive forward pelvic rotation. That it's probably beyond the normal five degrees that we would wanna see. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, so if somebody's got excess backward pelvic rotation of their opposite limb, so if he had excess backward rotation, which he really doesn't, on the right limb, then we might see that they've got too much forward rotation on the other one. This gentleman is certainly doing it to intentionally advance the swing limb um, during terminal swing, and that's usually when you're gonna see this. Um, and it helps to, like I said, it helps to increase the step length. Excess backward pelvic rotation. So greater than normal backward pelvic rotation. This gentleman is also a left-sided, um, a patient with left-sided hemiplegia. This is going to happen during mid-stance, terminal stance, pre-swing, initial swing, and mid-swing. So as he goes into terminal stance right there, do you see how far back his left-sided pelvis rotated? He's almost turned sideways, it's so far back. During terminal stance and pre-swing, he doesn't get it forward at all, even during swing. Do you see the rotation there where that left side of the pelvis just stays back? Kind yeah, of so behind. Time always be compensating for something else. 
I'm sorry, I missed the first part of the question. I was saying like this is like if they're gonna have backward poet rotation, you're like gonna be compensating for something else. Like, okay, yeah, for know. weak half or no heel off or I, yeah. Yeah, you're gonna have you're gonna have a lot of other deviations. I don't. It, it, it maybe that it's compensating for something off something else like no heel off, but it also in this gentleman's case could be due to that lack of motor control. So it could be um, an inability to dissociate the pelvis from the limb movement. He has all of his deviations because of what he's going on, what is going on neurologically for the motor control standpoint. But yes, absolutely. If you're not able to get the heel off the ground, this is excessive. His isn't just due to not getting the heel off the ground, even though we do see that he doesn't get the heel off the ground. Um, so his isn't compensating for that. But yes, in somebody else, this could be a compensation for not getting the heel off the ground. But I just, so with him, it's pretty excessive. You can see that that hip, that up side of his pelvis does not come forward in the transverse plane at all. It just stays back to the point where his whole body is almost rotated backward. If somebody's got a hip flexion contracture, they may also have this excessive backward pelvic rotation. So um, basically when somebody can't extend their hip to uh, get into terminal stance, what they're gonna do because they lack hip extension is they're just gonna over rotate their pelvis backward to compensate for that. So you're, you will see this and again, it's easy to see on him in a lot of people it can be a little bit more difficult to see because it's not quite as apparent. All right. Okay, so here we go. Contralateral pelvic drop. So right now, we're saying that the reference leg is her left leg. Does everybody see the pelvic drop on the right? Is your video streaming okay, right? I see it. <clears throat> So the reference limb is her left limb. She's got pelvic drop on the right. This is happening during loading response, mid stance and terminal stance of her reference limb. So as her reference limb is in stance, the contralateral pelvis is dropping. This is your Trendelenburg gait pattern. It is not called Trendelenburg in the Rancho method. It is called contralateral pelvic drop. The causes for this, and one of the main causes, is that she's got ipsilateral hip abductor weakness. So the abductors, those all important muscles that we talked about a lot yesterday during stance that maintain our pelvis, um, our, the level of our pelvis, if they're weak, that pelvis on the other side is gonna drop when the opposite leg goes into swing because these muscles over here are not strong enough to maintain our pelvis being level. That is one of the main reasons that we see this gait pattern. It could also be due to an ipsilateral hip adducture contracture or spasticity or a contralateral hip abduction contracture. But the majority of the time, this is going to be due to some abductor weakness on our reference limb, allowing the opposite pelvis to drop. It's not strong, they're not strong enough to let that pelvis stay nice and level during the swing phase. So before I move on, I want to make sure. I want to. So I want to maybe skip back to. I'm going to demonstrate this one because I want to skip back to something we were talking about when we talked about the uh, the hip and the thigh, and where we would see excessive adduction 
of the hip because with this deviation with Trendelenburg or with contralateral pelvic drop, we also can see excessive hip adduction. And I'm gonna kind of show you where that's gonna be. Um, so how am I gonna do this? All right, so let me pause the video. All right, so this will be our, our first try of, am I just a tiny little square on your computer? We can adjust it. So you can see, just you know, can yeah, make it drag it down, make it bigger. Might be a good idea. Especially when we got you on the 50 inch. <laughs> giant, giant professor. All right. How do you make it bigger? Because I can't even see myself bigger. There's like three little bars under the camera images. You can click and drag it downwards. I don't know if you see what we see, but mm. I think it might yeah, be different. I think it might be a little different. It's, okay. it's uh, basically a bar separating the pictures of all of us and then the yeah. slide. Yeah. And you then if you that. at the top, there's a little two arrows, one pointing up, one pointing down that says maybe view those speaking active camera who's talking everyone. Do you see that? Yeah. So you do view everyone or? Yeah, I view active. everyone. Yeah. And then if I just view. Who's talking? Okay. I'll figure it out. If you guys are going to be able to see me, then that's what's most important. I'm just going to make, I'm going to try and make sure that I can see myself. It's not a big deal if you don't see the upper part of my body. All right. Am I, is it too small? No, it's good. See me from the waist down. Okay. All right, so as this lady is walking, so the reference limb, my, my left limb is gonna be my bad side, okay? So that's the leg where I've got some hip AB, abductor weakness. So my abductors are weak over here. My, my glute med, my upper glute max, my tensor fasciolata, those really important muscles that are supposed to stabilize me as I'm on one legged standing and I'm swinging my good leg forward aren't working. So that in this case, what happens with these weak muscles over here is my pelvis is going to drop on that opposite side. So it's an unable to hold me. If I've got weakness here, I'm going to swing my right leg, but I'm going to get a pelvic drop because I'm unable to hold my pelvis level. So again, this is my bad leg. So if I'm unable to hold my pelvis level as I swing forward and I drop down, can you see how my thigh on this side goes into more adduction? So it yes. comes inward yep. because my pelvis has now dropped. Yes. If I'm right. tall, I have a nice straight thigh, but if my pelvis drops, I have increased adduction of the thigh on my reference limb. And that's because of this pelvic drop. So I have relative adduction. So when we were talking about this deviation in the hip and in the thigh, I wanted to kind of save it because this was one of the causes that you might see more adduction in the thigh. It's because the opposite pelvis has dropped down. Okay, so again, all right, and I'm not gonna be seeing the camera, so I'll try and stay in view as much as I can. This is my weak side. This is my reference length. I'm weak over here in the AV doctor. So as I step forward into single limb stance, my pelvis is gonna drop because I can't maintain that level pelvis. I just keep dropping. That is contralateral pelvic drop. So that's my weak hip AV doctors. Is that clear to everybody? Yeah. Good. All right. Now we're going to go to the next one. And I'm just going to stay here because I'm going to end up demoing the next one as well. Ipsilateral pelvic drop. The ipsilateral, and again, the left limb is our reference limb. Same leg is bad. This is a different lady, even though they both have the same body shape. So Ipsilateral iliac crest is lower than the contralateral. So during stance is when we're seeing it in this lady. Okay, so during stance, if you look and it, oh, I thought it had a bar. Uh, let's go back to the beginning of the video. 
So during stance, you can see how this side is lower than that side. Can you see that? See yeah. how that side is lower. Her left side is lower than her right side during stance. She has ipsilateral pelvic drop. Did everybody see that? Yes. Yeah. yeah okay. Okay. So it's the main difference between the two being ipsilateral and contralateral is at what point of the gait cycle they're in? So we're going to talk about that here in a second. Okay. So during during stance, ipsilateral pelvic drop can again be caused by hip abductor weakness. <coughs> Okay, so um, this this is where it gets a little confusing. So this lady has the same muscle weaknesses as our last lady did. She is just compensating for it a different way. Uh, so both uh, of these ladies have weak left-sided hip AB ductors. One of them has decided, probably unconsciously, to walk with more of a Trendelenburg gait pattern where her contralateral pelvis will drop. This lady has decided she's not gonna let her contralateral pelvis drop. Instead, she is going to end up having a pelvic hike on the right side and a trunk lean. So same muscle weakness, two different ways to compensate for it. Can you go back one to the is contralateral pelvic drop? One is ipsilateral pelvic drop. So with the ipsilateral, are we looking for more of a trunk swing as well as the the drop you in the pelvis? Or you're gonna see that. Yes. You are certainly they go hand in hand. As with the other one, we we were seeing more just a hip hike on the opposite side as opposed to the whole trunk kind of being tilted. The other one, you weren't seeing a hip hike, you were seeing a pelvic drop in Trendelenburg. No, no, I know. That's what I'm saying. That's how you can tell the difference between the ipsilateral and the contralateral is more of that trunk going towards the reference limb as opposed to kind of staying neutral. Yeah, you're almost, you are always going to see a trunk lean toward the reference limb with ipsilateral pelvic drop. Now, some people will walk with the trunk lean and not have ipsilateral pelvic drop, so don't automatically assume they have it. But if somebody's got ipsilateral pelvic drop, they're also going to have a trunk lean. That is correct. So I'm going to unpause this so you can watch her walk again. So same muscle weakness, still weak hip AB ductors or extensors on that side. You also may see something similar to this if they've got a short leg on one side. But for the most part, it's going to be that hip abductor weakness. And it's either going to present as Trendel, I don't want to call it Trendelenburg because that's not what it is on the sheet. Um, it's going to either present as contralateral pelvic drop or it's going to present as ipsilateral pelvic drop in stance of the reference limb. All right. Do you understand that? Are you guys seeing the difference between the two? Yeah, can you go back to the previous slide yeah. really? That's sure. what I'm trying to figure out. So she also has weak hip AB ductors, but instead of leaning over the left leg and hiking the right side of her pelvis, she just lets okay. the right side of her pelvis drop. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was talking about before. With this one too, you see she's more of a neutral in the trunk as opposed to yes. But the ipsilateral side, she was leaning far over. Correct. Okay. Yes. Same, but the same muscles are weak. And again, this is in stance of the reference limb. Okay. So this is in stance of the reference limb. All right. So now I'm going to throw one more wrench into things. So this lady has the deviation in stance, okay? So this one down here is what we're looking at. If she had ipsilateral pelvic drop 
during swing, it would be because she also has weak hip abductors on the other limb, on her contralateral limb. Right. <sighs> yes, Jack, I see you. Did you want to say something, Bryce or Alex? No. Okay, so my question for you then, if the lateral pelvic drop is not, is the same, but you would, all right, so just to not prevent confusion, um, ipsilateral pelvic drop is not contralateral hip height? Correct, because you're right. naming it for, there is no deviation called contralateral hip height. Okay. You might notice that, but that's not anything on our like sheet. She's her, uh, her right side. Correct, but we don't name that deviation for the contralateral limb. All right, so, all right. thank you. Mm -hmm. So again, this lady is walking and has a pelvic drop during stance. If for some reason we saw her pelvic drop during swing on our reference limb, that means that her hip abductors on her right leg are weak. So she actually has a Trendelenburg from the other side. Right. So unless you do, and then you might want to do a sheet for both of her legs if you're noticing that. Okay, so these hip AB doctors are really important in stabilizing the pelvis during gait. But the two I really want you to focus on because they're likely going to be the ones that you see most frequently are contralateral pelvic drop, the one we just showed you on the last slide, and this ipsilateral pelvic drop, both caused by weak hip AB doctors. We good? Gotcha. All right. I'll get out of my squatty position. I thought we the demo again. All right. Okay. And this one again is on YouTube. I don't think the last one was. Okay. Trump gate deviation. So if you look at the sheet in this one, you can see that it's either got, you know, backward, forward, right, left, backward, um, forward for rotation. So it doesn't have a bunch of check boxes. You just write in the number or the letter of what you think you're observing at a certain time. So we're going to go and talk again a little bit about what we did yesterday, how the center of mass is located in front of about somewhere between L5 and S2 during walking. And it's got that sinusoidal wave pattern in the uh, both horizontal and um, or vertical and transverse planes. So we see that pattern, that nice gentle pattern. It should go from side to side. Um, during asymmetrical gait though, that pattern of the center of mass is going to deviate um, some from that sinusoidal path. So backward lean. Sorry, I had to move something on my screen. So this is defined as posterior alignment of the shoulder girdle relative to the pelvis. So can you see how this gentleman's leaning backward as he walks? Good, pretty apparent. This can yeah. happen during all phases. It is a major deviation during loading response, I think, yeah, mid stance and terminal stance mostly because it's gonna be um, inhibiting forward progression during that time. Now, so depending on where we see the backward lean during the gait cycle, it can tell us what, what the cause might be. So if we see the backward lean during the stance phase, so let's pick a limb, his right leg, let's say. If we see a backward lean during stance, do you see a backward lean during stance on him of the right limb? Yeah. I think so. I do, yeah. So if we see a backward lean during stance, 
what's happening is that the person is probably compensating for weak hip extensors. So he is unable to use his muscles to help extend his hip. So what he's doing instead is he's leaning back so that that ground reaction force vector stays behind the hip and encourages a hip extension moment. So during stance, watch how he walks. So I'll try and pause it. Right about here, see how he's leaning backward during stance. He doesn't have a lot of hip extension. He's got very little at all if we actually look where his trunk is. He's leaning backward, likely because he's got weak hip extensors. So he doesn't have the muscles to really bring him and stabilize him into hip extension. So instead he decides to lean backwards, throw his weight behind his hip. That way our ground reaction force vector, oh, oops, that's not the one I wanted. That way our ground reaction force vector is falling from wherever the center of mass is in his trunk down to the ground, okay? Here's his hip joint center. We've got this ground reaction force vector now that he's leaning back way behind his hip joint, which is gonna encourage what moment at the hip, flexion or extension? Extension. Extension moment at the hip. Now he doesn't have to use his muscles as much. He's thrown his ground reaction force line behind his hip. He can rely on that to help keep his hip in extension. So he's got weak muscles here. So he's going to lean back so that that hip is encouraged to stay in extension because now the ground reaction force line is behind it. Yes, Alex, I see you. So um, if he weren't to lean back during his day, would he have much shorter steps? I couldn't. I could only hear part of it. If he would. Um, if he were not to lean back during his gait, would he have much shorter steps? I would, I would think so because he would feel unstable. So he would shorten up his step lengths by okay. quite a bit, probably. Yeah. Now, so this gentleman leans back during, um, during stance. Okay. Let me get this all. Let me get my escape. All right. So glad I learned how to use that. Now, if we see somebody who leans back during swing, it's likely due that they are compensating for weak hip flexors. So they're unable to bring the limb forward into swing because they've got weak hip flexors. All right, so I'm probably gonna do a demo of this, but the problem is you're gonna have to watch me from the front. So this man was doing it during stance. So I let's see if I can do it sideways. Okay. So instead of uh, doing it during stance, somebody with weak, weak hip flexors. I'm going to try and see if you can see my trunk some too. Is going to lean back during swing and throw their weight backwards to help bring their leg forward. So you see somebody walk like this and lean back during swing. I don't have much room to walk. You see the difference between the two? My leg is swing and I'm leaning backward so that I can thrust it forward. Okay. That is the compensation for weak hip flexors. So weak hip extensors, we see a backward lean during stance. Weak hip flexors, we're gonna see them throw their trunk backward as they swing their leg forward. So it depends on when you're seeing that backward lean it's going to tell you what their problem is. Is that clear? Yeah, there. All right. Can you say that just one more time? Can I, can I show it one more time? Oh, no. Can you just say that one more time? Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so depending on when we see the backward lean, this gentleman up here is leaning backward during stance. That means he's probably got weak hip extensors. If you were do, if the person's doing what I was doing and I was leaning backward during swing, I was trying to give some momentum to my hip to swing forward, it's probably due to weak hip flexors. 
because we okay. need a little bit of hip flexor strength to swing that leg forward during swing. So the, are both present for this? Uh, is what? Is, are both issues present, weak hip flexors and weak hip extensors normally, or is it just one or the other sometimes? <laughs> I hopefully they don't have both weak because then they're really going to have trouble walking. Um, so I will tell you to think what one you might see more often. I probably, I probably have seen the backward lean during swing more often. People who have um, weakness due to different injuries, not necessarily stroke because you're going to have spasticity, but people who have weakness, a lot of times, if those hip flexors are weak, you're going to see that backward lean to help them swing that leg forward. I don't know if I've ever seen somebody that's presented with, with this much of a backward lean um, during stance. So I usually see it during swing. Okay. Forward lean, this is probably going to be your most common gait deviation. You're going to see all kinds of people with a forward lean while they walk. Um, oops, sorry about that. So this is defined as anterior alignment of the shoulder girdle relative to the pelvis. This lady's got lots of weakness, but you'll see a forward lean and lots of folks just walking through the grocery store. So their shoulders are in front of their pelvis. They don't have great posture. They've got tight hip flexors. That is one of the probably my major reasons that you see a forward lean in somebody is that they've got tight hips. So you're going to see this potentially during all phases of gait. Um, it can be a major deviation during the stance phases. It can it tends to um, limit their forward progression. But a lot of times, again, we're going to see this um, due to those tight hip flexors. And the older people get, the more they sit, the tighter their hip flexors get. So you've got that anterior tilt of the pelvis, um, and it tends to lean that trunk forward. Um, it could be due to inadequate hips, hip extension. Again, inadequate hip extension could be due to the tightness in their hips, tight hip flexors. People might do it to stabilize the knee. So this lady, again, and I talked about this before. See how weak, how much hyperextension her knee is going into. She is leaning forward because she wants to stabilize this leg because it's so weak. So she's going to lean her trunk forward and bring that ground reaction force line in front of the knee so that it goes into extension and she feels more stable. So you will see this. This could be MS. This probably is MS or some sort of Guillain-Barre. Um, so leaning that trunk forward is going to help stabilize their knee because that ground reaction force line will now shift in front of the knee. Okay. Um, I have a question Sorry. on this. Yes. Uh, how can you tell the difference between this forward lean and an anterior tilt of the pelvis? An anterior tilt of the pelvis? Yeah. They Ooh. might have both. Good one because in the okay. picture it looks like there's some right, yeah. yeah, you don't have to pick one or the other. You guys can check every box on this thing if you think you see it. Okay, word. Yeah. Sure. So she might also have a, a, a rotate or a um, tilt of the pelvis along with the forward lean. I would think the anterior tilt of the pelvis would in, involve more of a curvature in the lumbar spine. Yeah. yeah. Yes, but I, you know, during certain phases, I bet she is anteriorly tilted because her trunk is leaned forward. So that could be a, a result of the forward trunk lean. Um, and she might not have that curvature because her pelvis isn't stuck in anterior rotation as much as we might see with other patients, but it just might be moving through too much anterior rotation during certain phases of gait. And so that's where you would check mark those boxes. Gotcha. All right, um, people using an assistive device. So people using a walker or loft strand crutches, they're gonna have a forward trunk lean. That's just comes along with the territory. All right, ipsilateral trunk lean. So this is defined as movement of the trunk toward the reference limb. So again, 
This is something that we saw with that um, with that ipsilateral pelvic drop. Now I will tell you, this lady has got a pretty good ipsilateral trunk lean, but she does not have ipsilateral pelvic drop. So they don't go hand in hand. One of these trunk leans, uh, or these trunk leans are one of the things that we see a lot with our, especially our transfemoral amputee patients. Um, and it, it, it can have to do with a lot of different reasons um, in amputees. Uh, in addition to what is listed here as well. Um, so movement of the trunk toward the reference limb, yes. When somebody has ipsilateral pelvic drop, you will almost always, you will always see an ipsilateral trunk lean if they have ipsilateral pelvic drop, just like we saw in the video. That lady leaned way over her left leg as, um, her right side of her uh, pelvis was hiked up and did that ipsilateral trunk lean on the left. But if you just see a trunk lean, it doesn't mean that their pelvis is dropping on that side. This lady does not have ipsilateral pelvic drop. She's just trying to stabilize over her limb. So she does have a trunk lean though. And usually with trunk lean, we put, um, yeah, you list either R for right or left for left. Um, this in people with two legs can be due to weak, weak hip abductors. Maybe there's a short limb on that side and they will lean over where the, the side is shorter. Um, if they've got an adduction contracture, so that leg is kind of moved into the center a little bit, that will cause them to lean over that side. A tight ITB band um, could cause it, I guess. It'd have to be pretty darn tight. Um, and so this one down here, impaired body image. So this is something that we would, and this is only seen in swing limb advancement. If somebody tried to lean over their leg while it was in swing, what do you think would happen? Um, sorry, repeat that again. If somebody was trying to lean over their leg while their leg was swinging, what do you think would happen? They would fall over. They would fall over. That's right. So when we have impaired body image, this is for people with either head injury or severe stroke who are not aware at all of where their body is in space. So if they tried to lean over to the side of the limb to, to one side that was in, while the limb was in swing, they would fall over. So it's incompatible with walking. They would fall. Does everybody kind of understand that or do I, do you want me to? So if you try to lean over a leg that's in swing, and actually I just have you stand up and try it. If you try to lay, lean, lean over a leg that's in swing, you would fall over. Are we good yeah. with that one? I can see it right now, actually. All right. So this lady's got a whole lot going on. Contralateral trunk lean. So first of all, we have to pick a reference limb. Uh, let me see. So let's pick the right side as her reference limb. Okay, so we're looking at her right leg as being the leg that we're doing our sheet on. So contralateral trunk lean is movement of the trunk toward the opposite limb. So during, during swing on the left side, people use it to be able to clear their limb. So as she swings her left leg forward, or wait a minute, I'm sorry, did I say it was the right leg? I already forgot. Yeah. <laughs> it's the right leg. So as she swings her right leg forward, do you see how her her trunk moves to the left side on right swing? Do you see that? Yeah. Okay, so that's contralateral trunk lean. All right. If she was in right stance and had a contralateral trunk lean, that means her other leg is in swing and she tried to lean over her swing leg, what would happen? 
she tried to lean over her screen and yeah. she fall. Yeah. She fall. She she fall. Fall. Yep. So this one is one that we usually always see while the limb that we're concerned with, the reference limb is in swing because otherwise the person would fall. And it's always almost always seen to be able to clear that swing limb from the ground. So she leans to the left as she swings forward on the right. Now, yes, she has a bilateral trunk lean. This is somebody that you would probably do two sheets if you were doing this. This, so, this sorry, um, this probably also goes along with um, excessive backward rotation of the pelvis or in the transverse plane um the attraction the, the one where the pelvis turns too far back um yeah that would be exciting. it looks like she definitely does have that uh, i'm noticing it on her left side um if the right leg is our reference limb though it's hard to tell. Yeah, she might yeah, have. Yeah, on the right it's, side as well. Yeah, it looks like she does have excessive backward rotation. Yeah, the good. Yeah, you can see it from behind even. Yeah, These good. All, um, um, weak hip flexors still, right? She could. That's yeah, why she. This. And it's hard to tell from this angle. Uh, it's hard to tell if she's not getting enough hip flexion or not. Um, so it could be the lady, she probably has a lot of weakness in general. I mean, her hip flexion doesn't look awful on the right side, but she's definitely got too much pelvic rotation and she's got some of that pelvic height on that right side as well. So it could be that she's doing that because of weakness in the hip flexors and that's how she's getting the leg forward more. Gotcha. So again, it could arise from an ipsilateral or contralateral problem. It really depends on which limb is your reference limb. So we've picked the right side to be our reference limb, and we just talked about a few things that could be the issue there. There's probably a lot of weakness. There could be weakness on the opposite side. This lady's got a lot going on with her gait pattern. All right, excessive trunk rotation. So this is rotation greater than neutral on the reference side. So we have in this young lady, um, her reference limb probably would obviously be her left side. But if I want you to just watch her shoulders and watch her trunk and tell me what you think you notice there. Is there any excessive rotation on one side versus the other? Yeah, her right shoulder is coming back more. Yeah. Does everybody kind of see that? Yeah. yeah, that was one of that's the first thing I noticed is how far back her shoulders kind of pulling. Isn't that pulling the rest of it too? Or is that is the right hip going back further when she's doing that shoulder pull, or is that just me? I don't know if the right hip's going back is that? further necessarily. No, she definitely has more rotation backward on the right, but again, the right, if we're naming this by her prosthetic limb, is mm -hmm. not her reference side. So, but I, but you are noticing, you know, what she has. And when we talk about prosthetic gait, this is one of the deviations that we do work on. Mm -hmm. um, so we might see uh, an over rotation or an under rotation on one side or the other. Um, the excessive trunk rotation is usually what we're labeling. She's got excessive rotation backward on the right side. So it isn't necessarily over our reference limb. But again, you might want to note that um, in somewhere in, in the notes or things like that. Is that how she's presenting? Um, this could be due, at least in people with uh, neurological issues, synergy with the pelvis. Sometimes um, the trunk will move in the pelvis, which is not what we want. We want the pelvis and the trunk to move in opposition to each other. When our right shoulder comes forward during gait, our left side of our pelvis should be coming forward. So we have that nice body rotation that we should have during normal walking. 
We might also see this when somebody's using like a single cane. We'll see that one side of their body rotates more than the other because they're reaching that cane out in front of them. All right. Okay, so let's take, I'm gonna put up a video. Does, who has a sheet or at least can get a sheet in front of them somewhere? All right. Grab a pen or a, probably a pencil if you've got one, because sometimes we end up changing our answers. Um, and we'll discuss it. So I want to give you 15 minutes to look at this and you can work as a group if you would like to look at this video. It's going to be a full body video. It's pretty grainy and it's going to have um, it's not the best video in the world, but it gives you at least a view of the toes and different things that are going on with this lady. Um, and so I want you to take 10 or 15 minutes to go through the form. Start down at the bottom with the toes, because you're gonna be able to see your toes. And I want you to go through and start to mark deviations, okay? Um, and just start to, you could talk a little bit about it. You may not get through all of the sheet. Uh, it does take a little bit of time to do it. And But I want you to start to mark things and then we're gonna go ahead and talk about them. So let me get to the video here. All right, let's see how well. Oh man, this is show up. So it's going to give you like full body view, then it's going to go to feet, and it's going to do some different things. So the reference limb is her right limb. So that's right. the one I want you looking at. Like, what's like all of that thing? Can we even tell? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eversion. How do we mark this up? And again, if you guys want to talk between yourselves, you can do that as well. I'm going to step away so, for a second. The way that sorry, the way that we mark the sheet is just by like checking it. Or yeah, you can do checks. Or X's, whatever you whatever you think you you um, want to put in there, and you just try to as much as you can isolate the phase that you think you see it in. Okay, so so for instance, if I look at her and I look at toes up, does she have toes up? On her right foot, she does. No, her right foot's the reference. Claw toes or hammer toes. So if I go back a little bit to the video, her toes are not touching the ground. So right. with this one, you can call it toes up if you want to. I mean, they're not touching the ground, so I would call it toes up. And what phase do I see it in? All phases. Every single one of them. So what I'm going to do is put an X and then draw an arrow all the way across. Okay because that's what I'm seeing in every phase. Thanks. Yeah. And since we're looking at the right leg, the reference limb is the right limb, correct? Yes, okay. I've picked it for you. Sure. Hey, would you also say she's got a little bit of that foot slap as well, or the foot well, flat contact as well so or I no? Want, I want yeah. you guys to do this and then we're gonna go over it together with me um, after you guys get some time to do it. I want you to take a stab at it for probably, you know, a good 10 minutes or so, and then we're going to go over it together. I have small toes over there. And some of you might agree with each other's answers, and some of you might agree with mine, and some of you might, might not. But I'm going to let you guys do this for about 10 minutes, and then we're going to go over it together. Okay. All right. Any other questions on how to fill the form out, though? It's just check boxes or X's. You want to try as best you can is to to isolate that phase that you're looking at and see if that deviation is present. Some of them are pretty apparent. You don't, you know, for me, I would jump around the sheet a little bit because that's me. But if you want to go um, from the ground up, you can also do that. Or if you know you see one at the knee, just get it checked off on your sheet. No. Right. I'll be back in a minute. I'll be back in a couple minutes. Actually, I don't think we'd see that. Okay. 
Yeah, Jack, I did. I filled out everything for him to as well. That's what I'm looking at. Both feet got it. Sure. I feel like she has e version in her foot when it showed the posterior review. Oh, yeah, she definitely got e version of the foot. That's what I was saying with the flat foot, like the foot flat contact, too. It looks like she's kind of slapping her foot on the ground. Yeah, Rich is right. And then also, if you look at the knee, it never like fully extends, it's always. Mm -hmm. Flex. Yeah, she's yeah, got E version. Definitely, definitely E version. Mm -hmm. Um, she has heel off, so that one's no. Doesn't drag. So this person has, like, I you would just. You say think she's good? Like, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Trevor. What'd you say? No, I said go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off. You're good. So it would just be eversion through every phase, right? Mm hmm Okay. Yeah. But just by looking at that view, do you guys think she's got valgus too or no? I don't think you would uh, mark eversion for the swing phase itself. So. But it's still like, I mean, maybe it's still present. So you then, yeah, but it would, that would still be during stance because she could have that flex. Remember how it's flexible, Pez Planus, if she may have an arch if it's not lifted? Yeah. So that's what I would I would say and go with what Alex is saying, how it's just during stance. She definitely has limited flexion of her knee. Yeah, yeah she doesn't become fully extended at any point. Maybe 15 degrees. Mm -hmm. The lowest amount of flexion she has not any. Um, Hit so yeah, I'll do the version for the stance phase. So that would be what for the the swing phase. She's got the limited knee flexion, right? And load uh, uh, loading response. Well, um, loading response. I think she would have um, the normal amount. Flexion. Uh, yeah, it's normal for loading because her her flexion is like is normal for loading, but then it there's no extending with like initial contact you would want. Uh, well, I mean. Sorry, that's not what I mean. There's no extending, like, there's not a lot of hip extension, and you see that with, like, her knee as well. It's always staying kind of flexed. But what do we mark? So, like, at one point, she's not flexing her knee enough, and at one mm -hmm. point, she's flexing her knee too much. How do we mark that? That's what I'm that's the only option we have is flexion limited, right? Or yeah, I think it's I think it's flexion limited in just the pre-swing and initial swing. I don't think it's really anything else. Oh, what's the excess she, box for? The excess row. Is that excess flexion or extension? And we just fill out uh, M or E? Yeah, I think so. I think it's excess you flexion. Say, yeah. um, you guys would say excess dorsiflexion also, right? Just because there's like a complete lack of plantar yeah. flexion. I think you're all the way around with anything. Yeah, but Wait, there's, well, there's really any dorsiflexion either. She's, she's kind of shoved. Yeah, there's no plantar flexion. It's like just dorsiflexed. Oh, so she's I not really dorsiflexing on that right foot, I'll be honest with you. She's not dorsiflexing either. Well, no, we would mark excess dorsiflexion for the points of the cycle where she would need to be plantar flexed. Yeah. And we would mark limited dorsiflexion for the parts where she needs to be dorsiflexed past five degrees. Mm -hmm. Because I but think she's only dorsiflexion because I don't really see any. What'd you say, Jack? I'm not really seeing any dorsiflexion. It just seems like she's maintaining neutral. Yeah, Alex, Alex is right. When like, when she's in like um, pre-swing or terminal stance, she has maybe five degrees, like right there, right there. Yeah. She has maybe five degrees of dorsiflexion, but she needs to have, what is it, 10 to 15 or whatever, 10 to 20? Like, I'm going to yeah. put it terminal stance. I'm going to put excess dorsiflexion because she's supposed to be pushing off right there on her right foot. But she's not. I don't like, or she needs to have more plantar flexion. See, I think, she, I think she's got excess plantar flexion, to be honest with you. Because I'm, I'm not seeing any dorsiflexion. It depends on what point of gate you're looking at. So in the swing, the swing phases, you are plantar flexed, right? 
Yeah. I get it. Yeah, I get it. Because she's hitting the ground with like her whole foot. There's no watch, heel. Watch, watch her metatarsal head. She's barely getting those off the ground. And if anything, yeah, the ankle right. is going to hurt. I didn't even notice that. That right. makes sense. That's what we're saying. Is there's, there's limited direction in, uh, or limited movement in both directions of yeah. plantar flexion yeah. and dorsiflexion. She's yeah. only got maybe five degrees between the two, probably between zero degrees and five degrees of flexion. And I don't think any plantar flexion at all. So in the single limb advancement, she would need to be plantar flexed. Right? Dude, but yeah, like or at least for but in swing and initial swing. Like in swing limb advancement in terminal in terminal swing and then in mid swing, like where you that if you're referencing the right side where they should be off the ground and the toe should be up, there's a lack of dorsiflexion there, so he would say excess plantar flexion. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm. That's that's what I'm. I'm Yo, doing. Vic, what do you? You haven't said a word. Dude, I can't hear you. <laughs> what? Why not? I don't know. It's like it's static. You should figure it out. It must be your internet. <laughs> but, uh, I have to figure it out. <laughs> okay, so when else are we supposed to play? James. Um, I think Rich already said this, but I'm putting uh foot slap. Yeah, I had that was that was the first thing I noticed was that foot slap. And mid swing and kind of swing. It'd be nice if you could see her knees. Well, I'm right now. I'm the right side. I'm saying right, right. Like, even when even when you're not contacting the ground, you try to be up and swinging. So this her is foot, initial, this is line. initial contact too. Correct. Yeah. So yeah, you can put it there too. Fine. I put it there. Sure. Um, I was just. Any, does anybody notice if she's in valgus or not? Just by looking at this view. I think how the end. Some, but not. It's not prominent. I don't think it's. Yeah, I don't think it's a big deal. You're talking about the knee, like. Yeah. Yeah, the knee. If it, it's a little bit in valgus. You know, I'm. I'm gonna. Add some water on. For her, our views that we get, I wouldn't say it's noticeable. Well, plus you're probably going to see Jenny Balvin with um, E version anyway. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm going to give you about two or three more minutes just to finish up what you can, and then we'll talk about it, and then okay. uh, give you guys a little break. All right. Well, if you guys can hear me, do you see um, excess hip flexion on all phases? Because I think I noticed that. I'll be honest with you. I've been trying to figure out the knee, knee and ankle. I haven't really noticed that. Uh, she doesn't go into extension at all, so I could see that. <laughs> well, she Just goes. In, well, yeah, she doesn't go into extension at all. You're right. I feel like there's a bit of a hip drop in there somewhere. Hip flexion in there too much. Okay, we'll go ahead and just start to go over it because we won't get through. I'm not going to do every single 
box on this form. I want to get through some more material. I just want to get you a chance to sort of practice using it. And I think that, you know, since it's taken us, a, you know, more than half of our day to go through this form, you can see that realistically, this probably isn't the best clinical tool to use to look at a patient's gait, the full form. Once we talk a little bit more this afternoon about things that are common um, to specific diagnoses, and the more types of patients you see, the more things you'll know what to expect. And so you'll know if somebody's going to have a lack of, or you're gonna be able to notice if somebody's got a lack of knee flexion at a particular time or not. Yes, question. You said that um, like in clinic using a weight pad, that would already be answering a lot of these boxes on the, correct? I didn't say. I said there'd be a, did I say it? that again for me. I'm trying to think if it's something I said That's or okay. not. Um, I, you might have said it. I'm not completely sure. Uh, so I think you said that using a weight pad, like for people to walk on in clinic, would answer a lot of the questions of this form anyway. No, not this form in particular. Yeah, so walking on an instrumented walkway would give you a lot of information about how much time they're spending on one side or the other or how long their step length is. The one thing that I really like about this form is those instrumented walkways aren't going to be able to tell you if the patient has decreased knee flexion at pre-swing or at initial swing or if they've got too much backward pelvic rotation. Those are things that I think as researchers, we still have left to find a good way for, for um, people to do in the clinic quickly without their eyeballs. There, it's hard to measure those things without putting a bunch of markers on people or putting a bunch of sensors on people um, and validating those measures. So no, the instrumented walkways don't let you know if there's too much or not enough knee flexion, unfortunately. Only things that will are, are things that are in gate labs and that's not very clinically friendly. Um, so this form is really for people to use for their own knowledge, expecting that you would reevaluate and use the same uh, characteristics of this form on your patients each time. So if you have, um, I kind of play with the idea of taking this form and breaking it down and when I have a stroke patient, picking you know, five of these different deviations that are common in stroke patients. And does Mr. Jones have this one during this phase of gait? I might not look at clawed toes because I just don't have time to take their shoes off and look at it. And so this form is a nice reference for you all to have to use in the future. If you decide that you wanna break it apart and use pieces of it, you certainly can do that. I just think it's a nice way for you to really be able to learn to observe gait because it is very tedious. Um, and we don't have patients who can walk for 10 minutes while we evaluate every single joint. We just don't. Um, so being able to shrink this form down into what you need clinically would probably be a great tool for you to have. But let's go ahead and we'll talk a little bit about what this lady looks like. Um, so we talked a little about toes and toes up. Um, we, we noted, well, I at least noted it sit there. What would you say that she has inadequate toe extension present? No. So I hear no. And part of the reason is her toes aren't even touching the ground. So I understand why that would be no. So, but during, if we were being strictly going by the rules here, during terminal stance and during terminal stance on the right side, does she have uh, 21 degrees of toe extension? Uh, no, she doesn't. Yes, her feet aren't even, or her toes aren't even touching the ground. But if we were gonna check that box, it's either a yes or no, it's there or it's not there. Does she have 21 degrees of toe extension at terminal stance? No. He doesn't. So I would put an X in that box. But it's also, she has a lot of other issues than her toe extension at this point. So that would be just a way for you to know that it wasn't there. You might want to note in there, toes don't touch the ground. 
let's move to something that we know that she's got. All right. So if we look at her foot contact, does she have four foot contact? No. No, I agree. Does she have foot flat contact? Yeah. 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 All right. So I would say two. Does she have foot slap? Um, no, not really. Always agree. Some people say yes, some people say no. On the right side. I'm going to say no. I'd say, okay. say yeah. I don't think so. So I take, you know what, again, there's no right or wrong answers to this. If you think you see foot slap and that's how you would categorize foot slap, then I would mark it. Okay, just as long as you're consistent with the next time you grade this patient. Make sure your definitions of these things stay the same for the most part. So if you're saying she has foot flat contact and foot slap, then make sure that's how you define it every time you evaluate her, okay? Personally, I would say she has foot flat contact and and I'd probably put no foot slap just because I think back to the video of the guy who's got that really uncontrolled plantar flexion coming down to the ground. She doesn't yeah. have that. She kind of just stays in the same position. This, well, I mean, with that too, you see how she's kind of like rolling over the four, has like somewhat of her four foot rocker. It's kind of got that rolling motion to it. So I'm thinking with that, that she doesn't have the foot slap as opposed to it just coming down and then just pop back yeah. up. Again, it's how you define it. And so I would say if you say she has foot slap, um, that it's pretty subtle if that's what you're calling foot slap. Um, foot slap is usually more of that uncontrolled lowering of the foot to the ground. But on her left side, I mean, I know we're still looking at the left side. We're not looking at the left. Okay. <laughs> so we're only looking at the right right now, just to kind of keep you know things organized. Um, all right. God, James. So, does she have excess plantar flexion at any time during gait? Wait, what'd you guys say? And I didn't hear it. No. Yeah. <laughs> Does she have excess plantar flexion at any point? I put yes. Oh, where? Excess. Mid stance. Excess plantar flexion? Yes. That was... Um, that was a high debate. We were all talking about. So my reasoning behind, I, I put it under uh, mid stance, terminal stance, and uh, so I think I put terminal stance, but I didn't mean to do that. But so I put that this... because she only has about five degrees range of motion in her ankle. Yeah. So this is mid stance right about here. You think that she's got too much plantar flexion here? Yeah, because I think she should be over the toe a little. Well, during mid stance, uh -oh. you should have a pretty neutral ankle. So right here, right now, oh, I've got a... Ah, where's my drawing tool? Darn it. See, I would think she's got more of the excess plantar flexion during mid-swing and terminal swing. Yeah, no, I, I see what you're saying. I think it's excess dorsiflexion right there because Correct. I would about three degrees dorsiflex and it should be zero. So she's got not, she doesn't have too much plantar flexion anywhere during yeah. the day. Do you guys remember when I said it was excess dorsiflexion and no one agreed with me? Just cool. remember that, Kula. Remember that I was right. <laughs> First so, time, last semester. You know what? Another another clue would be is you know she's got some flexion at the knee. This should be zero to five. She's probably got about ten degrees of flexion at the knee here. Too much flexion at the knee is gonna probably equal too much flexion at the ankle. So yes, she's got too much dorsiflexion. Nowhere during the gait cycle does she have too much plantar flexion. She's lacking plantar flexion. If she had too much plantar flexion, she would be at risk of tripping upon her own foot, right? It depends on what phase of gait. Um, well, during uh, swing, 
Mm -hmm. Initial swing and mid swing, she would. Yeah, if she had too much plantar flexion, then she would be at risk of tripping, right? So yeah, this lady's got excess dorsiflexion almost all the way through her gait pattern. Well, that's what I was saying. A little more excess plantar flexion and swing because her foot kind of looks like it's dangling a little bit as opposed okay. to... Let me go back and take a look at a... Oh, let me erase my drawing here. Um, oh, come on now. I want my video play. Please, come on. I can't get my player to go on. Oh, there it is. All right, so you said during swing, you think she's got some um, foot yeah, drop? Yeah, during, during mid-swing and terminal swing. Yeah, I could see that. I could see you saying that she had excess plantar flexion. It is hard though, because it looks like her neutral just kind of, or her ankle just stays in neutral. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, looking at that too, and when it's more of the frontal view, like how her metatarsal heads are just barely getting off the ground. Okay. That actually might not be due to the ankle, but might be due to the hip and the knee. I think her ankle, I don't, I honestly don't think there's probably excess plantar flexion anywhere at this point. But I understand what you're saying. I think it's just coming from another joint. That's why she's not getting that foot clearance. But because it looks to me like she does not go into plantar flexion at all at any point during this during the gait cycle. Um, but you could argue and say that if she's supposed to have, I'm trying to think anytime during the gait cycle, if we have to have 10 degrees of dorsiflexion. See, sometimes I don't even know, I don't have it all memorized myself. So if there was a point where you thought she needed more dorsiflexion, then you would be in the right to say that she's got too much plantar flexion. So I don't, don't necessarily see it. Don't you have uh, dorsiflexion in terminal stance? Um, you're going into dorsiflexion during terminal stance. I don't, uh, I don't think you have a certain degree of dorsiflexion at that point yet. Let's. But I can understand that if um, if you if you think you see it again, just make sure that you always uh, sort of define it the same way. All right. At any point here, uh, we said she has some excess dorsiflexion during many of the phases. Is there a point where she has no heel off where she should have heel off? Uh, no. No. This would mostly be terminal swing and pre-swing. Yeah, I agree. I think that her heel comes off when it's supposed to. It might not be the prettiest thing, but I, I would agree that I wouldn't do that for her. So with the, does she have any drag? No. Or she's got some clearance? Yeah, it's hard to tell from the video, but it does look like she clears the floor. And do you see any vaulting on the left leg? No. No, she doesn't have any vaulting on the left leg. That would be during swing of the right leg. So no apparent vaulting. This would be the place where you would see if she had vaulting on the left. And she doesn't come up on that forefoot at all, really, though. Or not at all. All right, let's see. Now, I know we don't have a good view of the knees, you know, in this frontal plane, but do you think that you might see something? She does have that, um, you know, pes planus sort of position of her feet. What do you think might be going on at the knees with that? Possibly a little bit of valgus, maybe? Valgus, yeah. yeah. If anything, it could be some valgus. Yeah at the knees because that one tends to go hand in hand all right um let's just go through a few more of these excess knee flex or i'm sorry limited knee flexion so at loading response as she puts weight on the leg knee flexion should be 15 to 20 degrees does she have too much or do you think she's got just about right or does she have too little i'd say she's close enough it works for her. I think her. <laughs> yeah, I think that's pretty good. I don't think it's excess, but 
and we go to take a look at mid stance and terminal stance, what should the knee position be? Zero. Do you think she's at zero? No. Um, no. Yeah, so that I would check. I would check those boxes that she has excess knee flexion at mid stance and terminal stance. So what about at term? Oh, go ahead. Or was sorry, that? is that box for excess flexion or ex excess extension or both? Excess knee flexion. So I would check it at mid stance. I would check it at terminal stance. So it looks like oh, I can't see myself on the screen. So I don't know if you can see it. Did I mark it? There it is. So right here, I would check that I see excess knee flexion at mid stance and at terminal stance. Now there's another box over here. At terminal swing, what should her knee flexion be? Zero. It should be zero. Does she have zero at terminal swing? No. Uh -huh. Does she have a nice straight knee as that foot comes to the ground? Nope. No, she's she's got about, I want to say, a 10 degree bend at the yeah, knee. I think it's probably somewhere around 10 degrees. So no, I would also check that box as excess knee flexion. Oops, where's my, there's my thing. So I would have all those boxes checked. So that's pretty much how I would do that. Um, I'm not gonna, we'll do, let's see. I don't see any wobbles in her knee. Did you see any hyperextension in the knee at any time? No. Any extension thrust? Um, no. Didn't look like she was thrusting. She was pretty much in flexion at the knee the whole time. So mm -hmm. we're not gonna see too much extension. Um, all right, so just talk a little bit about the hip. So we'll talk about, um, I want to talk about excess hip flexion, okay? So if we're looking at her walk here, does she have too much hip flexion during any point of the gait cycle? Yes. What point does she have too much hip flexion? Pre-swing. Uh, pre stance, terminal stance, pre-swing. Yes. Hip stance, terminal stance, pre-swing. She should be in hip extension for all of those. She doesn't even get to neutral. Does everybody see that? So she yes. is. She has. She has limited um, or excess hip flexion at mid stance, terminal stance, and yeah. pre swing. So it's not a big deal at pre swing. It... Loading response. How does she look at loading response? And she's putting the weight down on the leg. Oh, that's a little bit too far. So there's initial contact and loading response. What is her hip flexion supposed to be at initial contact and loading response? 20 degrees. 20 degrees. Does she have 20 degrees? What do you say? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe a little more. Yeah, it looks like a little more, but. I actually think she's probably right on about 20 degrees. Yeah. Um, and so I would not worry about marking anything there. For a second, I thought maybe she had um, limited hip flexion. I thought she was less than 20, but I think that she's probably around 20. All right, so I know we didn't get a good view of the pelvis and the frontal plane. Any thoughts on anything that might be going on in the pelvis when it comes to rotations or anything like that? Any guesses as to what you might be seeing? Probably uh, limited, yeah, limited, limited rotation backward especially. Because she's not getting any hip extension. Yeah. That's a, that's a great you know? observation. Yeah. yeah. I think that that's probably right on. Does everybody kind of see that with her? So nice. she's, yeah, she probably could use some more backward. Forward doesn't look that bad. Yeah, forward's all right. Yeah. But she definitely seems like she's lacking some rotation in that backward direction. All right. So I know we didn't get through all of it, but does it give you an idea of how this form is used? Yeah. It does take practice. I've had a lot of practice with it. The one thing I do like about it is it really breaks everything down. Um, so what we'll do, let me go ahead and give you guys a 10 minute break and then we'll just go ahead and go through the PowerPoint 
somewhat quickly that just talks about the different pathologies that you're going to see. We weren't going to do any gait analysis, I promise. <laughs> so go ahead and um, come back at 2.50, and then we'll finish up with that last uh, PowerPoint. Sounds good. Okay.
Okay. Oh, get a phone call. We'll wrap up some of this stuff here today. I want to wait and make sure other people are on here for a minute, and then we'll push through this. Yeah. I'm ready. <laughs> Sorry. Go. Sorry. I can see where Bryce and Alex have been camping out, so they're not there yet. Let me call them. They're definitely in the kitchen cutting up the rest of that watermelon. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> yeah, let's go. We're ready. Oh, you're probably right, actually, Rich. By the way, can you guys hear me? Yeah, I okay, can. Good. Yeah. They're coming. All right. All right, we're just gonna move again through some of these um, gate deviation or gate deviation, some of these common pathologies that you might see. I'm still gonna finish up by 3.30. So whatever I don't get through, if there ends up being any kind of a question on the exam, I'll go ahead and just replace it with a different question. Um, so I don't think I've got a lot of questions on this on the exam itself. Um, so just as a, I guess as a quick, review for what you need to be looking at. Again, I stress, please know what normal is, okay? I've tried to stress certain joints at certain phases over and over again, okay? Know what normal knee flexion is at pre-swing, at initial swing. Know what plantar flexion should be at pre-swing. Know what hip flexion should be at initial contact and loading response and 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 uh, um, terminal stance. Have a good idea of those main um, range of motions, okay? Because those are the kind of things I'm gonna expect you to know, not because I'm gonna say what is expected, well, there might be some questions where I say what is expected knee flexion during this phase, but they're not gonna be that easy. It's gonna be a matter of you, me, expecting that you know what normal is and you're going to sort of have to apply it to a situation. Um, so uh, with pathological gait, you know, have a good idea of what the causes are of some of these pathologies um, and, and, um, and, and during what phases they might be a major deviation. Um, if you have any problems or any concerns 
and you're, if you're looking over weekend and um, the exam's supposed to be Monday, right? Yep. Okay. So you can email me. I am going to be working all weekend on other stuff anyway, because I have a lot of other work that I'm doing right now as well. So just shoot me an email if you've got a question about something that is confusing you or whatever. I will get back to you. It might not be, if I'm on my computer at that time, it will be within a few minutes, but usually within an hour or two, I'll get back to you with an answer. I'm probably going to be working most of the weekend, so I will be on my computer. And so just shoot me a question if you've got any. All right, so let's go ahead and move on. Common pathological gait in adults. Again, I'm not going to worry too much about going over the objectives. Um, so observation and analysis in the adult neurological population, we're not going to talk about children. Pediatrics is sort of a whole nother class. Um, so hopefully you'll get some of that somewhere else. And so these different patterns can be influenced by weakness, abnormal muscle tones due to spasticity, a synergy patterns that we're going to talk about um, in coordinations, different things that happen because somebody has had an issue, usually with their neurological system. Um, and just remembering, at least for our PTs, proximal stability equals distal mobility. So you all might make the greatest brace in the entire world to put on this person's foot to help with their dorsiflexion. But if we can't get them up and standing and get a strong core so that they're able to ambulate, that beautiful brace is just going to sit in a closet. And so we really need to make sure that we're making this patient strong so they're able to use the device that you provide them. Um, Different considerations as a PT, we look at muscle. You also will, as prosthetist, orthotist, you'll look at different muscle tones. You'll look at spasticity. Um, those things can interfere with how you make a brace or how you um, apply a different device to somebody's body. And knowing that a lot of these patients are at increased fall risk, and I think we're going to get a chance next week to talk a little bit about um, fall mitigation in these patients, which is kind of a neat thing for, um, for you all to learn. So again, just reviewing why we do this, uh, observing one limb at a time, observing one joint at a time. That was just a review of everything we just did. So again, the gait parameters to consider, this is all just reviews, temporal spatial measures. Again, velocity, how many steps a minute are they taking? Those are kind of things that you want to look at, maybe to measure their outcomes, and we'll be talking about that in the future. So walking with hemiplegic gait, hemiplegia results usually from a stroke. Um, it is almost always one-sided, right-sided or left-sided. Um, it can also result from cerebral palsy. So you may see adults with hemiplegic, hemiplegic cerebral palsy. Um, but what I'm mostly going to talk about are stroke patients here. Um, so considerations that for gait, sensory deficits. These folks are not going to have normal proprioception in their joints for the most part. They're going to have abnormal muscle tone with lots of increased spasticity. They might have increased spasticity when they go to walk. Um, that's where sometimes when you've made an AFO, we can alter the AFO to actually have some tone reducing properties in them. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about AFO uh, fabrication next week. Um, and you will learn a lot about that in at the I, the Institute um, when you make AFOs. Clonus could be an issue. That's uh, uh, something that can cause problems with weight bearing. If the foot starts to flutter and fluctuate a lot, um, those can cause problems. And certainly weakness can be an issue. This all contributes to balance deficits in these patients and it all contributes to fall risk. So what is a synergy pattern? I've mentioned that a couple times throughout the lectures. Um, the definition is a stable spatial temporal pattern of activity across muscles simultaneously involved in movement. But basically, these are um, coupled patterns that will show up at multiple joints in patients who have neurological deficits, usually stroke or head injury. Um, these are stereotypical whole limb movements, so they cannot isolate the joint movements of their limbs. They move as a whole instead of separately. Um, so there's two synergies for the upper limb, extension and flexion. There's two synergies for the lower limb, extension and flexion. And they may not appear in all stages of, um, of stroke. They usually start to show up after three months of recovery from a stroke. So somebody who's had a massive stroke might have a flaccid arm and then a few months later start to develop a synergy pattern in that arm on their way to recovery. So a flexion synergy or a flexor synergy of the lower limb, 
This is a combination at the hip of hip flexion, abduction, and external rotation. So when we go to lay this patient down and bring their knee up to their chest, their knee actually kind of goes out to the side and starts to externally rotate and flex. Um, so that actually their hip flexes, abduction, abducts and externally rotates. The knee comes into about 90 degrees of flexion. This is pretty much what it looks like. The foot starts to dorsiflex and invert and the toes will extend. And the strongest component is hip flexion. Um, so I have a video here of a young lady who I think uh, is recovering fairly well from, um, from her stroke, it looks like. But she has a little bit of this pattern, though I think she's recovering quite a bit. You can see how her foot tends to dorsiflex and invert as she comes forward. Certainly the knee flexion has become under control, but you can see how the hip just kind of snaps up almost into a little too much hip flexion. So this is somebody who's been rehabbed pretty well, but still has signs of that flexion synergy. Um, and then additionally, the picture of this man here, you can kind of see that his knee is flexed in standing. This is more of what a hip flexion synergy or a, a flexor synergy looks like. He also has a flexor synergy up in his upper limb. So we see that the elbows flexed, the arm is brought into horizontal abduction or adduction, and then the, the wrist is sort of taken up into some amount of flexion. All right. Extension synergy. So again, we saw this gentleman in our last uh, PowerPoint. So the extension synergy, this is characterized by at the hip, extension, adduction, and internal rotation. Can you see the internal rotation of his leg there? That toe is pretty much like, like pigeon toed in. His leg is adducted. It's brought more to the midline and he's got a lot of hip extension. We talked about this with him. He doesn't have much movement in the hip at all, but certainly is limited in hip flexion. Um, the, the knee is kept in extension. The ankle is in plantar flexion and inversion. The strongest component is that hip adduction. So we see these people almost scissoring. When this gets really severe in our stroke patients, it's extension synergy, we can't walk them. That weak leg will come right across to midline and make it so that we can't walk them. And so using appropriate AFOs, this gentleman's got one on, um, to try and decrease some of that tone can help us in therapy walk these folks. Uh, I don't even know what the top video is at this point. Oh, this is where I have a video of somebody wearing a uh, knee hyperextension before um, before having an AFO on and then after. So some of the characteristics of hemiplegic gait, um, poor hip position, we do send this tend to see that contralateral pelvic drop or Trendelenburg because they've got weakness in those AD ductors on the reference limb. The knee a lot of times may snap into hyperextension during stance. Um, we have, there might be prolonged activity of the quads, but you can see how that knee extension moment isn't quite as bad once they're wearing the ankle foot orthosis. These folks also have dis uh, trouble disassociating the trunk and pelvic motions. This is the man that we saw with that backward pelvic rotation um, in the last, the last PowerPoint. So I won't show you it again, but he's not able to disassociate his trunk and his pelvis. Oh, his whole body turns sideways because he can't bring his pelvis forward on that side. So this is pretty common to see in people that have had strokes. So again, we're just gonna take a look at him. I'm not gonna make you do this, but the interesting thing about this guy is he's got some contralateral, or he's got some trunk lean, and I forget which side it's to. So once I start to watch him walk, so he's got contralateral trunk lean. All right, so during left stance, he's got contralateral trunk lean, okay? This was the one that was incompatible with gait because during left stance with contralateral trunk lean, this leg, I'm pointing at my screen with my finger like you guys can see it, this leg, should be in swing because this leg's in stance, right? Well, we know that contralateral trunk lean over a swing leg is gonna make you fall over. Well, he's not gonna fall over, but what, because he's, 
he's um, compensating. How is he compensating? He's taking the tiniest, shortest little non-functional step with that right foot that he can, because if he doesn't, he's gonna fall over. All right, so watch again. He's got contralateral trunk lean during stance. If he lifts up that right leg, he's gonna fall over. So instead he takes these tiny little choppy steps and doesn't even have a step length on that side. So just so I'm understanding his contralateral hip lean is on the right side? He His reference limb is his left limb, okay. but he's leaning to the right. So here, look at, I actually caught him in swing. If he didn't put this foot down right away, where's he going? He's gonna fall, yeah. He's gonna fall right into the pews, okay? This is a case of having that body awareness and that uh, the proprioception and things like that aren't there. So to keep himself from falling over, he just takes these tiny little non-functional steps. But anyway, that was my point on that video. Multiple sclerosis. So a lot of times these folks are gonna be bilaterally involved. They are gonna have sensory deficits. Many of them have pain issues as well. They do fatigue very easily. So we have to be careful, especially during the summer months that we don't exercise these people, over-exercise them in physical therapy because that can exacerbate their symptoms. Um, they get tired easily, exposure to heat and humidity will increase their symptoms. A lot of them do have spasticity. They may have um, some visual disturbances as well and certainly weakness, um, mild to moderate paralysis. So this lady, um, characteristics of gait, with multiple sclerosis, it is incredibly variable. Some people show very little symptoms. Some people are so severe, they have to be in a wheelchair. Um, so staggering, uneven steps, um, for, poor foot placement, uncoordinated limb movements. Okay. Oops, I unpaused her. I'm gonna try and get her so she's up and walking. She likes to look in the camera. So um, ataxia, so a little bit of that off balance when you're moving. Um, certainly loss of balance. So this could be typical for somebody with multiple sclerosis, really short step lengths, inability to balance over the limbs long enough to take nice long step lengths. And I'll just have her, I'll let you watch until she kind of walks back. Now for folks like this, if she starts to develop things like, you know, excessive plantar flexion during swing, then, um, you're going to end up seeing them to help them with either an AFO or potentially something like a knee ankle foot orthosis if she ends up developing some sort of instability at the knee. But certainly orthotics can help some of these folks to walk a little bit better. And she probably needs a cane or two as well. This lady also has multiple sclerosis, much different presentation. All right, so she's showing that forefoot contact. She's not getting the heel down. Lots of knee flexion, lots of dorsiflexion, lots of hip flexion, lots of forward trunk lean. But again, these two ladies have multiple sclerosis but look very different. So these patients are not necessarily going to always present the same way. Sometimes they're more unilateral, a lot of times they're bilateral. And uh, the thing about multiple sclerosis patients, a lot of times they're pretty young and active and then they get hit with this. So at least in therapy, uh, they, they were pretty hard workers and it was fun to work with them. So Parkinson's disease, like I said, I don't know. Um, you said that you do see Parkinson's disease uh, patients in the clinic. What are you seeing them for in particular? I know Alex was, and Victor, both of you said that they've come through your clinics before. Um, I've probably only seen one or two. Uh, my grandpa had it as well, but he just had foot orthotics. Um, usually it's just kind of the short choppy steps. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, do you maybe, do anything? Maybe a spring leaf AFO. Ah, uh, okay. Or okay. A carbon AFO maybe. Okay. Something just to, to help clear the foot. Propulsion and Right. Gotcha. What about you, Victor? Same thing? Um, honestly, I can't recall um, seeing any patients with it, to okay. be honest. Okay. 
All right. Yeah, I was, that makes sense though, doing something to maybe help just a little bit with foot clearance, like a spring leaf um, type uh, AF or a posterior leaf. We'll talk about those next week as well. All right, so a lot of times with Parkinson's, absolutely, you're gonna have bilateral involvement. There's gonna be lots of weakness. Uh, the uh, Their gait can be dopamine dependent, whether they're on phase or off phase. Um, they do fatigue easily, especially with some of that increased, uh, um, increased exertion. So this is a pretty typical uh, gait pattern for our Parkinson's patients, the tremoring, the staggering of the steps, very short step lengths, festinating gait pattern, forward, trunk, flexed hip, flexed knees, and Let's this see. guy faked me out good. He is about the best imitator of Parkinson's gait that I have seen. I'm usually pretty good at calling him out, but he's really good, really, really good Parkinson's gait pattern. Oh, depends on um, yeah, so very, very flexed name? forward. Over your name. So, and they do look different when they're on their um when they're on their medications, but those multiple short step lengths are pretty common. All right, so gait with incomplete spinal cords, certainly this might be a patient that comes into your clinic. In some incomplete spinal cord patients often get back to ambulation, but it can take years of therapy to do it. So in that time, they go through multiple different kinds of orthotic devices. They may start out with a hip, knee, ankle, foot orthosis. And then as they progress, go to just a knee, ankle, foot orthosis. And then just to an ankle, foot orthosis. So they're kind of cool patients, I think, for you all to see because you're going to see them for a long time and you get to really work with them as they do better. And so I'm not going to expect you to know any of these. This is just for your own reference, um, the Asia scale. And um, uh, but there are different um, different ones that are going to present probably more often. The brown saccard I used to see a lot because I worked in more urban hospital settings. So this is more of a unilateral spinal cord injury. We used to see this a lot with gunshot wounds. Um, so you know, folks who were either in the wrong place at the wrong time or doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. Um, so we would see a fair amount of brown saccard. Um, incomplete spinal cord injuries. And they are fairly wheelchair dependent. And then they come to therapy and they get moving. And over the course of a few years, they can get back up and get moving again. So it's really kind of a fun patient population to work with. Um, and that's basically what I said here on, the, on, the, um, on this slide is eventually they can get back to being better. Now, incomplete spinal cord, we do teach them a swing through gait pattern. If you, you look at this young man, he's in at least knee ankle foot orthosis yeah they use utilize bilateral sometimes knee ankle foot orthoses and we'll teach them a four point gait pattern where we have them just swinging through the crutches um, this is pretty common until we start able to teach them to use um, an alternating gait pattern but again we need them to be in orthotics to do this otherwise their feet are not going to clear the ground so here's somebody else who's a little, oh shoot. I, somebody else who's an incomplete spinal cord at the T7 level, so at the thoracic spine. So he's got full use of his arms, but he's got some abdominal weakness. But you can see if you watch him walk, one leg tends to do a little better than the other. He's not wearing any bracing or his feet wouldn't be so plantar flexed. Um, but again, he might be in recovery. He may have started close to this level. It's hard to say these patients are pretty variable. But again, there is a need for orthotics with these folks to help them get to normal gait patterns. Any questions on any of those that you've seen so far? So again, this is just sort of give you an indication of things that you might see in the clinic. Um, this is somebody with an even higher level of incomplete spinal cord. He is somewhere at the cervical level. And I know that because he's got tenodesis in his wrists. So when he stands up, can you see how his wrists kind of overextend as he holds on to the walker? So he's got some shoulder strength. So my guess is he's incomplete, probably close to the C6 level um, because at C7, 
you you have more wrist control and certainly at C8. Um, but he's got some of that tenodesis motion at the wrist. He's got enough grip strength with the tenodesis at the wrist that he can grab the walker. But again, you know, walking, I don't think he's got any braces on his legs either. So the only concern with these folks is they've got so much weakness in the legs as they're rehabbing that sometimes an orthotic can actually weigh them down a little bit too much. Um, so I think that that's where sort of the art of prosthetics and orthotics certainly comes in being able to work with these folks. And now that you're working with more materials like carbon fiber and these lighter polymers, you can make these braces lighter for people and hopefully make them more functional because they are super weak and uh, putting a heavy brace on them is just going to deter them from getting up and walking and it's not gonna make them more functional. Um, oh, this is stuff that you'll see in research that's just called a locomat. We use it for spinal cord patients, more for research and at your big rehab hospitals, you'll see people train on these, but nothing you really need to know. Um, gait with traumatic brain injury, again, these patients present extremely variable. Um, they all are gonna have spasticity. Uh, they're all gonna have some sort of synergy pattern. Depending on how long they were in the coma, the worse they're gonna come out. Um, so again, you will see these patients for bracing of both the upper limb and the lower limb. There's gonna be bilateral involvement. They're gonna have visual and vestibular disturbances. These are probably the most challenging folks to rehab. Um, are people with traumatic brain injuries, especially if they're severe. They're gonna be very deconditioned. A lot of them have been in comas for months and now they're ready to get up and get moving again and we're expected to help them do that. Um, observational gait analysis is the preferred analysis. There's very, very, very little research on gait in these folks because their gait is so variable. Um, here's one person uh, walking. So again, not a lot of research on them, lots of spasticity. Um, they may have a lot of other injuries that are orthopedic because many of these, usually men, um, have been in motorcycle or car accidents or boating accidents. And that's where they got these massive head injuries from. So not, a, not only do they have a massive head injury, they had a broken pelvis or they shattered both their limbs. So they've got a lot of these other polytraumas going on with them. So they're a very, challenging patient population, but certainly are in need of orthoses. Um, this gentleman is actually fairly functional um, for walking uh, with, a, uh, with a head injury. He's only using a cane. Many of them are either wheelchair bound or end up with walkers, depending on how severe the head injury was. They definitely are gonna show synergy patterns. So here's another young man. So again, looking at the different ataxia, very little control. So he's in a walking frame. This is something that we'll use in therapy. Um, so somebody like this, working with the PT, maybe to try and make some sort of orthosis to help decrease some of his tone. He's got a lot of spasticity and a lot of synergy patterns. So it looks like he's been working to where he at least knows that he's got to put his foot in a certain place. But again, Lots of variability in how these folks are gonna present um, when and if they do come to you. And these are people that you may see while they're still in the hospital on rehab units or in skilled nursing facilities where you come and actually have to work on making the brace right there while they're still there. So Guillain-Barre, this is again, as all these other ones can present very varied in different patients. So this young lady has got a lot of um, lower extremity involvement. Usually with Guillain-Barre, these folks are paralyzed and then are able to return back to some sort of functioning. It can take years for them to get better. So certainly they go through bracing um, when it is needed, but there's gonna be bilateral involvement, a lot of weakness, they're gonna have sensation issues, a lot of balance problems. Um, but usually they recover pretty well. So she obviously has a lot of issues with her gait. It doesn't look like she's wearing any sort of brace. It doesn't really look, it, uh, it looks like she gets pretty good foot clearance. What we worry about with these folks is that they're gonna be dragging their feet and then it's gonna increase their fall risk. 
And then another person with Guillain Barre. This is actually somebody I know. And this is him after, oh gosh, at least a year of recovery. He was wheelchair bound at first. But talk about lateral trunk lean, external rotation of the legs because his hip flexors are too weak to bring his legs forward. So he uses those, um, the uh, adductors and the hip, the ones that work for adduction and hip flexion to try and compensate for that. He now walks pretty well, but it has been, it has been probably eight years since he had it. And he doesn't really have too much in the way of deviations anymore, but it was a very, very long recovery. So again, he looks different than the last lady. Um, he probably could use some bracing on his legs to help clear them and get him a more normal gait pattern. Um, and I think at one point he did have some that he wore. Okay, all right, we're not gonna do outcome measures today. That's gonna be something that we're gonna do next week. So that is sort of my brief introduction to what different patient populations look like who may enter your clinic. Obviously, we didn't talk about amputees because amputees are what we're gonna be talking about next week. So anything else, any questions on stuff that we went over today right now at this point? Or anything specifically on these diagnoses? We didn't really talk about circumduction, did we? No, but that's not something that is on, remember I mentioned that on Jacqueline Perry on the Rancho's sheet, we don't have circumduction. What circumduction is, is really a combination of uh, pelvic hike and ex excess abduction during swing of our reference limb. Okay. Okay. And so, and probably, and you would probably throw in, my guess is you would throw in uh, limited hip flexion, especially during the swing phases and during um, uh, probably certainly during mid swing and terminal swing. So it's a combination of those. And that's what I kind of like about the Rancho method is circumduction. We all know what it is, but it doesn't explain what's happening at, at the functional level. It doesn't tell us that there's a pelvic hike and that there's excessive hip abduction during the swing phases of gait. And so circumduction is easy for us to see, but it doesn't tell us what's going on. Okay, got it, Does it thank you. Your question? I am not gonna ask you a question about circumduction, but when I talk in conversation with you, we'll talk about circumduction. But okay. when we're learning this, there's no circumduction on this. Yes. I'm good. I just need to probably review some of these videos just so I can practice for myself. Okay. And again, you know, you can shoot me questions over the weekend if you're confused about something or unclear about something. We went through this stuff fast. I gave you guys, you know, four days worth of material and they were long days. Usually my students are out after two and a half hours and they're like glazed after that. So this is a this is a lot of material in a short time. So all right. No other yeah. questions, Rui? Oh. I'll yes. probably have questions for you now. <laughs> all right. Okay. All right, then um we'll be in contact. I need to get in contact with Emily to find out exactly how uh you know, I wanna go over the exam and make sure that everything that I'm asking you, we went over, which I think we did. I think we got through all the material. And then I will get the exam to her. And has there been a decision made as to where you guys are gonna take it or how? I believe we are having to do this from home. Yeah. Yeah, we're definitely gonna be doing it uh, remotely for sure. Yeah, we just haven't figured out how um, they're going to proctor us yet. We were talking right. about possibly setting something up on our phone where either you or Emily could watch us take it through our phones while we take it on our computers. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think that's still up. In the yeah, I think they're working on it and they're, I mean, hopefully by Monday we'll know. Yeah, I would ask Emily. Okay, I'll get in touch with her and, and find out a little bit more about what's gonna be happening. Um, 
and I'll get it. Yeah, I'll get it to her probably later today or early tomorrow. And um, yeah, I think that's it. And then our plan again is to meet next Thursday and Friday. And then uh, probably at that nine o'clock start time as well. And if we're going to do pretty much two full days of lecture, it's going to pretty much run close to this last schedule. Um, I think that, and I tell my PT students this, this is the harder stuff. The next stuff, amputee, and prosthetic rehab, um, it's, it's just not as hard. <laughs> it's not, but it's good to know um, because we're going to be looking at gait deviations in people with prosthetics and we're going to look at them a little bit differently. But, um, but again, you need to know what normal is. And so that's, you know, that's kind of the, the drive home message, know what normal is, and you're going to be able to figure out pathological. So we are not meeting on Monday or Tuesday, but we will be meeting on Thursday and Friday. I think that's the plan right now. But our okay. exam is on Monday, right? Yeah, I think it says two to five. So I'll get with Emily just to check and make sure, you know, what, what, what the plan is at this point. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think like five on Monday. You don't need three hours for it. So, how many questions is it? I think it's 70 or 75, multiple choice. Um, again, that's if I'm not, you know, moving anything around because I think we talked about everything. So, usually I will give two hours, and that's generous. Um, for my students, I um, for the board exam and physical therapy, I think they're allowed 70 seconds per question. So we try to time it out on our exams that we only give them 70 seconds per question. But I tend to give a little more and a little more because my exams take a little more thinking time. Um, so usually I give two hours for the exam, and some people use it. All right, sounds good. All right. Okay. So get in touch with me if you need, um, if you have any concerns or questions. I will be, I will be answering emails this weekend. So. All right. All right. Yep. Yeah. Bye. Otherwise, all right. stay healthy. Bye. 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 Good weekend. Whatever, James. <laughs>